Welcome to another episode of Market Overdrive. I am your host, residential real estate broker. My name is Carla Mina, and I am with Compass. And with me this afternoon is my co-host. How are you, Joel? Hey, everybody. Joel Schaub here. We're excited to be back on the air. Carla, you look beautiful, and you, you have your voice back. I do have my voice back. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? He's We're so kind. You're always so nice. So before the show started, I said, uh, Joel, can you just like give the mean t- to me for a little bit? You know, like, have this kind of banter. But what did you say, Joel? Well, I can't say a mean thing about you. <laughs> it's, it's just in my nature to make sure that uh, we're supporting the people around us and just giving back knowledge. So we're happy to be on another uh, episode today of Market Overdrive. Don't you just love him? He is seriously the sweetest person ever. Um, but with us this afternoon, Joel, do you want to go ahead and introduce your guest? This is going to be a cool show, guys. I'm really excited here because on my right I have a not only a, a friend of mine but somebody that actually is really really good in the business and today's focus is it's gonna be like a an attorney roundtable or maybe even a, an attorney rumble we just had the real estate rumble so on my right I have a good dear friend of mine Michael Gunderson he owns the Gunderson law firm uh, Michael how are you doing today? Joel, thanks for having me. Yeah. Doing good. So, Michael, how long have you uh, had the name, and how did you come up with the name The Gunderson Law Firm? Um, you know, it was a tough, tough couple of uh, hours trying to think about it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I just said, might as well put the strongest Norwegian name I can on a shingle outside my office, and, and there it was. But, yeah, this is year number 14 in business. And where are you located right now? Uh, Roscoe Village. We're on uh, Roscoe Street. Of about a uh, mile and a half from Wrigley. I hear you're a Cubs fan. Is that- I've gone to a couple of games. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can't yeah. kind of drive around that uh, area of the city without seeing my face on one of those billboards. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, no. it's pretty awful. So, um, but no, we. <laughs> it's uh, rough, isn't it? It is. Um, <laughs> Say they're cleaning up the uh, pest problems. I know. I'm not going to be mean to you, Joel, but so that's hilarious. so perfect because you're actually going to be the like the protagonist here in our uh, conversation today. So, Carla, tell us who else is on the show. Well, I think today's show is going to be super exciting. So, it's just to manage your expectations and let you know what we're doing tonight. This is really super cool because we're going to have a legal debate. I, 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 a brawl. Up, uh, I couldn't come up with a better name. That's so, what it is. A legal debate. So we have Michael here, but we also have Mr. Stewart. How are you, Stewie? How are you? Glad to be back. Uh, thanks for having me again. Of course. So your wife lets you come out and hang out with us again? Absolutely. After 42 years, she doesn't need to see me too often. So. <laughs> I love Stewart because I called him. I'm like, hey, can you come back on the show? And he's like, well, let me ask my wife. So I waited and waited and waited and waited. It took you, what, like a week to get back to me? Your uh, wife is tough. More like 45 seconds, I think, <laughs> I called back. So <laughs> Come on, Stuart. you got to play hard to get. You can't right, just be well, that easy. Oh, so long. <laughs> so. <laughs> We're glad to have you back. It's really good to see your face again. And you do a lot of stuff for sellers. You do buyers as well. But on today's show, we're going to be having you kind of play the role. We're going to tee up some great questions for you. And you're going to play the side of the seller's we, we do both. We would prefer to represent sellers, but we're good with buyers, too. And uh, we're the firm of Kessler and Kiernan, and we're out in Arlington Heights, and we go everywhere. So. Come on, Stuart. Hashtag stop yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is how this is going to work, gentlemen. We're going to play pretend like we're here at the, the political debates. But um, so you know that uh, obviously your attorney is a very important part of the transaction. As soon as you found your dream home, obviously you're c- going to conduct that home inspection, and then you're going to figure out whether you want want to buy that property or not and so you're going to hire a legal service company that's going to represent you in the transaction in Illinois it happens that you really don't have to hire an attorney is that correct oh I wouldn't go to a real estate closing without one I'll tell you that you, right so a lot of people recommend it but by law we don't have to hire one but obviously like I said to, like I like to tell my clients I wouldn't buy something unrepresented so I wouldn't let you buy something unrepresented just because there's so many You know, it's so tedious, right? There's so many things that can come up. So anyway, our attorneys today are going to take our questions and we're going to get both of their opinions to kind of see so that we can show you how two different attorneys can represent you differently and then you get to choose the style that you prefer. So, uh, Joel, you want to start with our first question? Well, the idea here is a lot of times, Michael and you and I were talking about it before we got on the air today, just managing expectations for a buyer. So the people that are out there listening right now, if you're getting ready to buy a property in the next six to 12 months, you need to have an attorney. You need somebody that represents you, somebody that'll actually go to bat for you. And it doesn't cost a lot of money. You don't have to wonder who to select. You're going to literally go through the services of somebody that was referred to you. So when you get through a transaction, one of the big things that comes up, guys, is inspection items. 
you're not buying a brand new house typically. So in this scenario, we've gone through the contract and something crazy happens during the inspection. Maybe there's a roofing issue or there's something big. Michael, tell me how you would help protect the buyer, okay? So I'm the buyer, I'm going through a transaction. I still wanna buy the house, but I wanna get some reassurances that I'm not buying a POS, right? Yeah, right. that's you know that's an important part of it because you're, you're essentially making sure that you're protecting your client's interests, right? The, the worst thing you could have happen is they close, they discover a lot of deferred maintenance that they're now on the hook for. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's a negotiation. It's bringing to the attention of your seller what your issue is. Um, you know, sometimes you'll be looking for quotes, estimates to bring to their attention and say, I'm interested in moving forward, but, you know, only if we can come to some sort of agreement, either on a repair or a credit or basically something that makes me comfortable that I'm not accepting, you know, something that I was one aware of. Because when you're doing a showing or you're going to see a place, you're not climbing on the roof and you're not spending three hours looking at every nook and cranny so it's an important you know piece of the puzzle and you're getting an inspector professional to look into you know the basic functions of the home so specifically here in this scenario I think that we need about three to five thousand dollars to complete this transaction and make sure that it's right tell me what we would propose to Stuart here how would we get this done to protect us and actually have both parties really come out uh, even Sure. You know, it's it's a formal correspondence. The attorneys draft letters pursuant to portions of the contract that allow us to discuss matters before it's a quote unquote formal contract. They call it attorney review. The contract is still pending. Both sides can walk away with no no harm, no foul, return of earnest money. And we're proposing modifications and term changes to the other side so that we can try to consummate the deal. Uh, in that case, we would propose a repair. We'd propose a credit. We'd you know rationalize it justify it, maybe show them a portion of the inspection report, say, this is the reason why I'm not pulling this out of thin air. This is what we need to feel comfortable moving forward. Propose it to your client so that we can talk about making a deal and moving ahead. I like that you said that. Stuart, what do you say if it's a repair versus a credit? How would you protect the seller in this scenario? Well, we take two steps. First, we contact the agent to find out if they've already negotiated some sort of a repair or credit uh, between the agents because we don't want to be working at opposite purposes to what the agent is doing and then of course we talk to the client and most of the sellers don't have the expertise to do the types of repairs that we see because they usually involve health or safety issues very often we'll see a repair request for an electrical item so the easier thing for us to do is to get our own estimates and say, here's what we're, we're willing to give as a credit. But sometimes the buyer insists that it be repaired before we go to closing, and then we just have to deal with that. And that, that I mean, $3,000 is a lot. So obviously we have to justify it from a realtor perspective. We have to see why it is that you're making those recommendations. And I mean, obviously I represent both buyers and sellers, so I've seen both sides of the transaction. So when that happens, we typically do ha make suggestions. And I think for the most part, buyers are looking for instant gratification. They want to move in. They don't want to have to do all the work. And they assume that the seller is going to take care of the items. And more so, they are not looking for a credit because then now they have to go and shop it around, get quotes, and then do the work after they've you know saved money for the down payment they just want to move in and get their furniture in so they don't want to do all that work so the repair thing I think is where we usually start with the request we ask the seller to to do it but then you have a seller that's relocating and it's moving and they too don't want to take care of the stuff so then what do you do then when your seller says I'm not doing anything well take it as is you bought it this way take it well that's the first question did the con was the contract an as-is contract if, if it is the seller can say, I don't want to do anything, look at the contract. But that's the argument. Again, we saw the property, it was beautiful, we fell in love with it, my client loves the property, but how was I supposed to know that you had a broken window behind, I don't know, a door in the basement? And then also there was the fire damage on that wood floor underneath that rug, I never saw that. I saw it through my inspection, I want you to fix it. A lot, a lot of those types of things come, through, come out more so in the walkthrough right before we do the closing than they would in the inspection because they still wouldn't have seen underneath a rug or behind a cabinet during the inspection period. Uh, we advise our sellers straight up, don't hide anything because it's going to come out anyway. Um, the new contract made it so that the buyers can't send us their inspection report anymore. 
unless we, uh, you know, unless we ask them to send it. And as huh. a seller's and attorney. I love that you guys are doing that. I mean, seriously, really, really, Stuart, tell us why you don't want to accept that, that inspection report. Oh, we don't want to see it because if the deal falls out with his client, we know about everything that his inspector has told us that is wrong with the property, and now our seller is on notice, and they have to disclose it to the next buyer. So remember, negotiating tip 101, aha moment for all you buyers out there. If you are in negotiations, just candidly share that report. I know you paid for it, and you don't have to share it, but I would strategically, because guess what? If you're not doing those, repa those repairs, or at least giving me a credit to correct those repairs, you have to disclose, 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 disclose. So your next buyer is going to know about it. And you're going to have to do the work anyway, so stop being a lazy seller and do the work or give my client the credit. What, do you, what is your recommendation in that, Michael? You're looking at me like I'm crazy. No, no, no. <laughs> not, not at all. Uh, you know, far from it. I mean, you know, we get a lot of times it's balancing personalities and what people feel they're entitled to and things like that. I, I will talk with a buyer, and they'll have a long report, and they'll say, oh, my God, this place is a death trap, and I'll read it, and it's fine. And I'll basically tell them, look, you didn't hire an inspector to come through and tell you your place is fine. You hired him to come through, pick it apart, find every possible issue so that, one, they're not on the hook for missing something, and two, so that you have an idea of what's going on. And I'll have clients that ask for the sun, the moon, and the stars an inspection report, and I tell them it's like, like going to the doctor. Have you ever gone to the doctor and they do every test and they tell you, you know, no more fried foods, lose weight, you know, exercise every day? You know, you, <laughs> yeah. you have them pick apart everything. You don't go to the doctor and say, oh, you're fine, you'll live forever. So how many times did you leave that appointment and then immediately you know go vegan and start running a marathon no you didn't <laughs> the inspection is the same exact way you know they're going to tell you everything there is it all health and safety that you don't have this anti-tip bracket on the stove and your you know whole family is going to die no you know use some common sense realize you know you're not a renter anymore if you're coming from being a renter if you're a previous homeowner you should know better this is part of the process of becoming a homeowner and maintaining a property so it's just you know be reasonable use some common sense and and you know take a look at it for what it is which is not you know an indictment of this property it's just what the inspector needs to do i completely agree and i'm just being silly here and over exaggerating because we just left a closing table where we literally have made some agreements during the inspection period and the realtor felt that she shouldn't have to do make those corrections and we're like i'm having a conversation with her about what should be done and then i'm like I shouldn't have this conversation with you because the attorney's already negotiated your client accepted per contract here this is what you should do but going back to your statement um i always ask my clients i mean it takes them about 30 days to get their properties on the market and it's the craziest time of their lives because they're busy but they're painting that you know stain in the ceiling that may that a buyer may think oh there's you know roofing issues there's water coming through water seepage so there's that there's a stain in the closet well there's water in the basement and some some of these things have been corrected but it was never painted because life happens and people get busy or, you know, I love it when people say, oh, I'm going to buy it and I'm going to fix the kitchen and, they, and then they never do it. And then I'm like, can you please just wipe, whitewash the cabinets and make it look nice because it's, you know. So what I'm getting to is the fact that buyers will go there and if there's a stain in the ceiling, it could be like, what, 100 bucks to paint it, $19 um, to get the paint. But they'll be, they'll ask for $5,000 credit. Sure. Right. So avoid that, because when buyers are asking for credits, I know you lenders front upon that, too. There's a cap. So what I always do is I preface at each buyer that we're working with. So we come from a point of education and we're teaching the buyers right up front, especially now with the new contract, that it is not a license to just nickel and dime the seller. OK, so often for years, we saw buyers that would go in, get a property under contract at a certain price, knowing that even even if the inspection came back fine, they were going to find something to lower the price for that purchase. And nowadays with that new contract, what we're seeing is some common sense. Michael said it right. You're actually using some common sense. The other side isn't trying to screw you. You should not be working against the seller just because you didn't negotiate the price right. Michael, do you feel right now that we're seeing less of the negotiation once the inspection comes in and how can we use common sense to help some of these buyers? I, I think that you know what, what's helpful is when you have a team and everybody's kind of working together, you have experienced agents. Um, I think a really good agent will temper their client's expectations, will not be afraid to kind of 
stand up to their client and then say, listen, this contract, and, and Stuart can comment on this too, the contracts all talk about what's an acceptable and an unacceptable request. And I think the more that your team refers to the actual agreement, in a sense, it says, listen, it's not a license to nickel or dime. The agreement that you signed very specifically says what is and what is not an appropriate request. Well, well Stuart. The last time I was on the program, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the new 7.0 contract. But one of the things, I, the best example I can give you is I had a deal this week uh, where a buyer's attorney came in with a laundry list, you know, 15 items. Yep. And on 12 of those, our response as the seller was, uh, this is not an appropriate item for, to be raised under the 7.0 contract, and therefore we are denying it. Screen Attur door, small things, right. nickel and dime pieces. On yes. the three remaining items, we ended up with a $200 credit to the buyer, and they caved and they bought the property anyway. Can I just, okay, okay, you slow, you're, slow down. I love how the lenders and the attorneys who are not in the trenches are saying they were nickel and diming you guys. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I, I like some of our buyers just really don't want to do the work. And sometimes it comes up, right? Because we can't see it when we're doing. I don't have an infrared camera that says there's moisture reading. And I know that nowadays it has to be a genuine like hazard, right? For us to get credits for it. Um, but for the most part, we just want the stuff fixed, So we don't have to, our clients don't have to do it after closing. Again, they just want to move in their furniture and set up their clothing. They don't want to have to make repairs on your property. Carla, some of your buyers should just continue to rent then, okay? Oh my you God. really have some buyers. If they're going to continue to go under contract and then just nickel and dime the seller, that's not what we're in business to do. And I get that, right? That's not what well, we're trying to do. But in some cases, um, it's not that we're nickel and diming because we understand that. But it's a, okay, so you you want to go back on the market and try this again in 30 days to market the property, get another buyer who's going to come back and tell you the same thing because they're going to have the same inspection. But and how many times have you seen them do that out of spite, though? Well, they will. I don't think it's out of spite. One of, the, one of the other good things is most of the real estate attorneys, we know each other. Oh, Council so you and I know each other. Like <laughs> so so we, we, we're able to pick up the phone and basically say to them, is this something that your client really wants to have done? Or, or is there room to move? And most of the time, depending upon who the attorney is, but most of the attorneys will be straight up about what's really going on here. Absolutely. You know? or, or calling you and saying, listen, I've got a client who asked me specifically to ask for these things. I've explained to them what is an appropriate, not appropriate qu uh, request. Let's, let's talk about something feasible to get a deal done. And it's it's more because, again, they voluntarily entered into this agreement. Nobody is. We're not litigating. We're not against each other. We're trying to come together. And so, you know, generally a, a good three minute chat will, will generally help get you across. The and, and our firm's attitudes are that nobody dies at a real estate closing unless they have a heart attack. At the table. <laughs> the so, rate's too so, high. So, they died right so, at the table. So we're, not, we're, we're not standing with pistols at the end of the conference table ready to shoot each other over these things. We want to see the deals go through. Nobody in the room gets paid unless it closes. Okay. And I think the word is now hit the streets, right? Because I think at the beginning, a lot of deals were falling apart just because the expectation wasn't to be a manage. I think buyers were still expecting for sellers to fix everything on that punch list versus understanding what was that safety hazard and what was not. So moving from that, what happens when we've negotiated a closing cost credit of, say, 3% to go towards the closing cost of said property, uh, but then we're asking for additional credits because you've decided as a seller you're not going to repair, you're going to issue a credit. I'm above, above that 3% margin, so now we're asking for an additional $2,000 to fix I don't know, the sidewalks and the roof. So what do you say to that, Joel? Well, on the lending side, guys, there's limits, okay? So I'll kind of geek out here for a minute and just kind of share what I know as far as the maximum credits on a handful of different transactions. Because, for example, you can't get a seller on a $250,000 house to give a ten dollars to $20,000 credit. That would eat into above and beyond the total closing costs and prepaid items. So typically, if a buyer is putting down 5%, they can have a maximum credit of 3% of the purchase price. If they have 10% down or more, you're typically allowed up to 6% of the purchase price. In certain situations, that's not enough. So we're either gonna have to negotiate a price reduction or at closing, we may put money into escrow. And so those are the situations that you wanna look for. And what we're doing is partnering with agents and attorneys that really know how to make sure that you're protected. Can you explain a little bit about these escrows that Joel's talking about, Michael? Um, you, you can do a, a holdback, um, technically on a, on a side of the transaction.
to cover, you know, items and, and things that need to be repaired. Um, you know, you want to be as creative as possible and not run afoul of, of RESPA laws and, and things that require disclosures and, and how they're done. Um, you know, ideally, everybody's being above board, but really, you know, sometimes it's being creative. I've had sellers pay contractors in advance, mm -hmm. you know, basically send a check to a contractor directly uh, to do the work, the contractor, the buyer's choice. Um, I've had, you know, escrows held for future repairs. Uh, things as long as it's disclosed to your lender and and you're doing it uh, the right way you know just kind of depending on how much you're talking about and what needs to be done just kind of tailoring a solution to it Stuart what happens if the work is is completed but it's not up to my standards what do I still have to turn in that escrow we there'll be a written agreement between all the parties as to what's to ha what's supposed to happen as to whether it's going to be re-inspected or not and sometimes actually the seller's attorney or the buyer's attorney is holding that escrow and until everybody signs off on it and has agreed that it's been done the way everybody intended, uh, the escrow isn't released and we just sit with it until it's resolved. But uh, here, another example we had is we were at the 3% limit. Walkthrough came along and there was a problem with a gas leak on the property. Oh, wow. Well. So, this, we as the seller's attorney had to hold back the money until the gas leak could be repaired and we let the buyers have their own inspector come out and tell us whether it was good enough for them or not. We're yeah. trying to avoid litigation here. I mean, nobody wants to be in the courtroom. Right, know. and I think that's where it becomes a little complicated, right, because my standards versus the, the seller's standards and I think sometimes it's best to just get it done before closing because after closing is done, then you do have to hire an attorney to litigate in order to get those funds back. I mean, there's also been scenarios where um, my clients have been the sellers and the buyers did not want to release the funds because they didn't feel that it was the right product. Um, during the inspection period, we also ask for permits if you're going to do, um, you know, if you want a licensed plumber to do the work or licensed electrician. So you do have the available, the, you can make those requests, correct? Right. You can make those requests. But very often, let's say our person is, the seller is really good with working with, with tools and fixing things. And they'll just say, I'm going to do it myself. We're not going to hire an, a licensed electrician. Is and, that allowed? And absolutely. But the, it's going to be in the buyer's discretion at that point. They can refuse it at any time within 10 calendar days after the uh, contract is accepted by the seller. The deal can fall apart on inspection issues. So unless we've extended it by agreement. But, yeah, there's, we, have, we have it all the time where a seller... You know, he's a janitor or he's a handyman, and, and he can fix the electrical himself. We'll see on an inspection report almost every time that a, a ground fault circuited interrupter, the GFCI outlet, they is in presence. They always find that. Yeah, well, it's one, it was one of the uh, inspection items du jour, I call it, or, <laughs> where we'd see it on every single report. But most times, people can go to the hardware store and fix that themselves. They don't need to hire an, a licensed electrician for True. that. True. I'm always concerned, right? Because if they did it bad the first time, I don't want them to go in there and doing it with a fork and a spoon and try to fix well, some electrical problems. The, yeah. <laughs> the problem That's true. we're seeing now, though, is with the new 7.0 contract, a lot of the inspectors have gotten wise to it, and they'll add the words to a, a normal problem saying it's a health and safety hazard. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, we're adjusting you know, our wording so we can get it passed. <laughs> right. And, and, and this month's thing is the electrical box is manufactured by XYZ company, and there's been a warning about that company that the electrical box could catch fire 20 years from now, so it should be replaced. Never mind that it's been entirely functional and perfect for 40 years, <laughs> and you know they've run the blender, the vacuum, and the dryer at the same time, and it's been fine. But again, it's you know we're lawyers, CYA, every everywhere you can can do it. So Whatever you're doing right now, just write the verbiage so you can have your inspector write it down and make sure you get those credits because these guys are tough. You're good, but you're tough. Look at, I can't get a penny extra from them. We totally see the need for inspectors. <laughs> I'm a homeowner, and you know I had my house inspected 35 years ago before I bought it. But but so we see the need for them, but we also know that they're getting paid to find things wrong. So, you yeah, know, good we stuff, that. Good stuff, you guys. So, listen, say we, we just can't reach an agreement. We're closing and no one's agreeing on anything. And my client just gets so upset and they walk away. They're like, we're done. I'm not going to do this. They're not going to give us, what, $100? You're letting this deal fall apart because everybody has principle. And they walk away. Can you walk away at that point at closing? 
You want to take it first? Yeah. Michael? You can do absolutely anything you want. I mean, you you know, people we talk about, you know, am I going to be sued? You can be sued for anything. You can be sued for scowling at me, right? Uh, do people walk away <laughs> over <laughs> that? that you know, sure. And what generally happens is I've thrown down a C note before mm -hmm. because I have other things to do. I have other closings. I have a family. I have things that I don't want to listen to you guys go over $100. So I will put it on the table, and there are closers at Chicago Title that will confirm those stories. And a lot of times <laughs> the that, agents— so Now you know how to get 100 bucks. Right, Michael. if you want to get 100 bucks <laughs> from me. But, yeah, I mean, can they? Yes. Do generally all of the individuals involved in the transaction— help reach you know a resolution yes because you know walking away getting into litigation it's a race to the bottom and it's it's just not what you'd like to see Stuart well I got into real estate because I got tired of doing litigation for one thing uh, but uh, the same thing if, if it's got to come out of our pocket uh, and and very often you'll see the agents and get together and, and take some you know take out their wallets if, it, if we're that close if it's something big, and the buyer walks just because they got cold feet at the closing table, which which rarely happens, but can. The seller's sitting there with earnest money that they can say, hey, we were ready to close today. I like, like that. Yeah, so really that's my concern. So does this, the buyer lose their earnest deposit or whomever cancels a deal, do they forfeit some sort of like funds because we're under contract? under contractual agreement right yeah they they can but i i can't recall an instance really where somebody's walked away when there's a thousand or five thousand dollars sitting there in the seller's hands at the last minute usually it'll be something earlier than that in, in, the, in the process if that's going to happen and um you know i've been practicing law now for 43 years and i can't recall that happening Here's another scenario. We've covered a lot right now as far as inspection items and things that come up, but what we want to do on Market Overdrive is really elevate the, your real estate IQ if you're listening and you're getting ready to buy a place. And so one of the other things that we have is when we go under contract, we're writing an earnest money check. And the question that always comes up to me as a lender is at what point in time can I get that money back? Okay. And one of the things that we've just covered a lot was attorney review period. And Michael, I'm going to tee up this question to you. The second thing that happens is very often, unless you have a suitcase full of cash, you also need what? A mortgage, okay? And so what do you typically have on these contracts? A mortgage contingency. So I want us uh, attorneys to touch base on this. If I'm a buyer and I have a mortgage contingency, how long do I typically have? And what happens if for some reason I lose my job? Can I get out of that because I didn't get the mortgage from the bank? Yeah, typically you'll set a timeline in the original contract. You'll have a date of acceptance and you'll say you have 30 days, 45 days in order to produce a commitment to get a mortgage, which is showing the seller side you've secured financing. Uh, those dates are routinely extended as things are processed, and appraisals are done. Sometimes there are little hiccups in deals that, you know, really it's nobody's fault. It's just processing, verifying employment. So those deadlines are a point where you can withdraw from the contract if you aren't approved for financing. Um, in a situation where you lose a job, that would typically result in a denial of financing. And as long as you're within that contingency date, uh, you're in good shape. But, you know, the, the backside to that is if you are in great shape, you have a, a loan clear to close and you're a week out from closing and you lose your job, you're in a real, real tough spot because you had a commitment to loan and you are outside of your contingency period. Uh, Stuart, as the seller, what do you see on these types of transactions? Well, the new contract form itself says that, that the buyer's got 45 days or, or uh, five business days from the, from the closing date that's in the contract to get their loan. Um, from the personal level, I had it happen to me when, I went, uh, when, I, when we first went house shopping. Sure. My last time I was employed by anybody else and what kind of made me make the decision that I'd go out on my own is I lost my job mm -hmm. the day after I signed a real estate contract. Oh, no. <laughs> the day after. We notified the seller right away, 
and we got our money, we got our earnest money back right away. Right away, because oftentimes buyers on big transactions are putting down. It's not just a thousand or five thousand right. dollars. Very often, you have a client putting down five percent on a million dollar deal. This is some money that you would not be willing to walk away from. So this is protecting our buyers, right? Well, the, yes, and the attorneys on both sides need to be really aware of the time deadlines. I mean, I know you have a great calendar system, and so do we where we're keeping track of it because if we miss that, that mortgage contingency date by a day if we're the buyer on the buyer side of the deal it becomes a cash deal mm -hmm. it certainly and, does and 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 and, and you can and force the to buyer us. to pay cash yeah. You Michael, know. before we go, tell everybody where they can actually find you. So say your name, say your phone number, and let everybody know where they can reach you. Mike Gunderson, 312-600-5000. One off from a couple of real high-powered personal injury lawyers. <laughs> That's uh, great. <laughs> we're in uh, Roscoe Village. We're a storefront on Roscoe Street, and uh, we'll be out at the festivals. Come see us. Come say hi. We'd love to uh, love to chat real estate. I really like what you gave us today. It was so amazing. Thanks Stuart, do the me. same for us, please. We know where you're at, but we got to let everybody know one more time. Tell us <laughs> your full name, your phone number, and just the best way for them to reach you. I'm Stuart Kessler, and my partner, Therese Kiernan, and I are at Kessler and & Kiernan, and we're at 8 Four seven eight one eight nine nine three three or the cell eight four seven six six eight two five six four and we're out and about everywhere in the city and we're located in Arlington Heights. Carla, what did you think? I love it. Stuart, aren't you gonna do a shout out for your special realtor friend? Oh I have <laughs> First of all, last time I was asked who my favorite host is, and I'd be totally remiss if I didn't tell you that, that Carla is my favorite host. You say it so, again. <laughs> Carla is my favorite host. Not, <laughs> not, not, not just my oh, favorite host. Man. Not just my favorite host. On the last program, Carla said, I really like what you said, and you're going to get my next deal. Mm -hmm. And she made good, and oh, good. we are now. And what else did I tell you? I told you I was going to take care of it. I was going to negotiate it, yep. make sure we got it there, and I teed it off to you right after everything was negotiated, right? Absolutely, and we did it just the way we said it was going to go down. Can so you train your control. colleagues to be as good as you are? Yeah. That, that <laughs> I, do, I do. She's fantastic. Oh. Well, Stuart, because I said to Stuart, listen, my word is all I've got. I put a lot of money on my word, and I value it. If I'm going to say something on the show, it doesn't mean that I'm just. Or fluff, right? right? I'm gonna do it. So we had a deal. We put it together. We agreed because uh, there's no reason why seller, um, realtors. I was representing a seller in this right. scenario, and the buyer's agent and I agreed on what was ne what needed to happen. Uh, obviously, I was very candid. We did take care of some cosmetics. I was aware, but we weren't gonna take care of like the some other things that I thought weren't necessary. But I think at professionals, we basically understand what is nitpicking and what is something that we should in good faith make sure that the next owner um have you know just have the great a, a great experience through the whole process i so wish able to do that i wish everybody handled it like that i got an email i asked, i called carla i said have you take have you negotiated anything and i got an email going straight down the list of what was accepted and denied and all i had to do was the follow-up letter plus the attorney review letter oh my so, i was like put it in writing ink that that's like real estate attorney like dream scenario it was. got my heart a flutter right now <laughs> it, 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 it was awesome your heart flutter. I love it was it. awesome thank you thank Great you guys show. for coming thank on thank you so much i love you Stuart. you know i'm a fan and likewise See, Joel, did you even know that we have to go through such crazy heartache just to get these deals to go through? Like, once we're done on our site, we tee it over to you. Yeah, I thought it was just signing a contract and then they get the house. It's not that simple. So I've even heard today how you could actually get a nice C-note at the closing table with certain attorneys, right? No, did you, have you been in a closing? Yeah, it's a $100 bill. Like, that, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you been in a closing where you actually see something where you're like, I'm so glad that I've hired a good attorney or having somebody that cares about the buyer because so often these emotions happen and you really need somebody to take care of you. You've seen this, right? Yeah, I mean, it's really complicated, right? Because we're all trying to do what's best for our clients. And that's what I like to remind our industry professionals that let's get into an agreement that's mutually acceptable to all parties. Everybody wants to make sure this person becomes a homeowner and your client is done with the property and they need to move on. There's no reasons why emotions should be involved in the transaction. At that point, you're done. Let's celebrate. Let's just reach a point that 
you know, makes sense for everybody. But arguing at the closing table, I think it's just unprofessional. Yeah, so often these attorneys try to justify their worth, right? And sometimes they're finding something out of nothing. And what we do as professionals here is literally making sure that we're, we have the best interest of our buyers at heart and our sellers and just getting through a transaction. We're not living paycheck to paycheck. We want to make sure that these buyers have a good experience, the sellers have a good experience, and your name is the number one thing. You, you yeah. can't go out and really butt heads. It just doesn't work in today's uh, business. Right, and seriously, every transaction is completely different. Today we were at a closing and we couldn't ask for any additional credits because it was a newly remodeled property, so the lender wasn't going to allow it if we got any credits or had an escrow after closing or at the closing table because they said that the appraiser was going to front upon that <coughs> because, again, it was a newly remodeled property, so they wouldn't allow it for an escrow or credits at closing. Have you heard of that? I've seen this quite a bit, and so so often you just have to come up with a solution. What we're working towards is it's nobody's going to die. It's a place yeah. that you're going to live in, or it's an investment property. And all we have to do is meet eye to eye. And so it's exciting when you can get those deals done. And also what's exciting is the guy who's over to my right. <laughs> we are in the midst. Look at the... Exciting? Yeah, you mean the most sophisticated? What is it? The most handsome man in the world? No, yeah. it's not that. It is that. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him. Oh, my God. Can you please come on this show every Thursday? Absolutely. Look at how I good this smile. room looks. With It'd this viewer, so are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd be excited to see me, Ken, not the Absolutely. You. Absolutely. This is, uh, this is the best seat in the house. Introduce I'm great. yourself. So my name's Ken Monroe. And I run Chicago Scene Magazine, and uh, it's good to be, it's like old home week here, right? That's uh, right. Uh, so uh, in the process of relaunching the magazine, getting involved a lot in real estate, and Carly, you know that, and you could talk a little bit about uh, your involvement with us in that way, and and uh, yeah. Great so, stuff. Yeah, so on stuff. Market Overdrive, we decided to invite uh, Ken here because he is an extension of our show. He's out there in the trenches, and he is... Um, in charge of putting out some of the most amazing events and obviously uh, taking the information from not just our platform, but also online. Um, tell us a little bit more about the marketing that you're doing and just elevating people's real estate IQ with respect Absolutely. to real estate on your magazine. Yeah, sure. So it's, it's a little bit unnerving because if you were to told me this morning that uh, I'd be in, in front of uh, recording equipment and bright lights in a soundproof room with two lawyers, uh, I might not have got out of bed. <laughs> that's right. But, <laughs> but, uh, that's gonna, that's gonna but you're, here. <laughs> you're here. I'm okay now that I'm here. Yeah. So, uh, no. We, uh, you know, w with the evolution of Chicago scene, we started as parties, nightlife, entertainment, all that. You know, we do the boat party. It's floating debauchery. It's 500 boats and 10,000 people, <laughs> the largest event on Lake Michigan every year. And show off. It's, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun, yeah. So, uh, but no, we've, we've kind of evolved into a, a slice of everything that's going on in the city. And one of those slices is real estate and business, right? And so uh, we do a lot of different events that, that feature and showcase the different professionals and people and, and uh, businesses in the space. And so coming up, as an example, on the 27th of June, we'll be at the SX Sky Bar, which is uh, part of the uh, re, uh, remodeled Essex Hotel. Uh, beautiful place, if you haven't seen it. Just a really swanky, chic, sexy place. And uh, we're going to be hosting Jerry Carlick and JK Equities as the keynote speaker to the Red in Shy series. So we've been producing, co-producing this event with uh, some folks out of New York that run the Red in NYC, Red in, M in Miami, and now in Chicago. It's our fifth fifth. Ken, round. what you do really well is when you go to these networking events so often, there's a lot of drinking and no networking. And what you've really done in the city of Chicago is put these two together so that it's not just industry and nightlife, but some of the best events that I've been to are ones that you've put on because of the professionals that are in the room. So when you're actually able to bring people together that can grow each other's business, Tell us a little bit about how you've been able to put so many great people in the same room together. Yeah, so it's, uh, like any of the events that we do, they're all purpose-driven, right? So like when we have one of the parties that we talk about, the purpose is celebration of whatever it is, the waterfront, New Year's Eve, whatever it is, right? So um, the purpose of our client-facing, so we have, we're kind of a bifurcation of who we are to the market, right? We have our subscribers that read what's going on, and they come to us as the insider's guide of where to go and what to do. But then there's our clients that want to reach those subscribers, and the purpose of the events that we do for them is driven either around activities at the neighborhood level, yep. where we do our neighborhood-oriented events to bring all the businesses and people and, and residents of the neighborhood together to network, or it might be industry niche-specific, whether it's the fashion industry or the dining industry and so on. So real estate and business, and that's where you guys come in. 
And I love that. So part of that where to go and what to do, obviously, it's important for us and you. But for us uh, on Market Overdrive, we're here to obviously elevate your real estate IQ. Uh, but we want to take it to these events because it's an extension of the learning process. So can you tell us a little bit about your panel and what our guests are going to be able to learn at, the, at this event? Yeah, so um, the gentleman who produces the event, his name is Achari Canver, and he's out of New York. Uh, and he has partners wide ranging from Magellan and, and these types of businesses and and uh, so he brings different professionals to the panel uh, to do interviews and, and let them speak about their experiences and goings on. So Jerry Carlick of JK Equities, he's in the process of building 1000M at uh, 1000 South Michigan and 1400 West Monroe. Uh, so these are major projects, right? And so whether it's the, the bankers, the builders, the, the suppliers, insurance, uh, every piece that touches commercial real estate, they're there, and not only are they there hearing about the different projects, um, Alex Samoilovich was a speaker at our last event, and the idea of micro-homes, right, that are going on in Uptown right now, and, and it was a great, if you're able to hear over the crowd, which is sometimes tough, and it's, it's tough to manage that, um, but the recordings of that, we, we capture that and then make it available to others as well. I love it. Yep. And a lot of you guys see me when I'm posting, I'm always saying lifestyle, realtor lifestyle, because part of it is not just transacting and helping our clients find the best product, but we have to stay cutting edge. What's happening? What's coming up? What's changing in the landscape of Chicago? I mean, a thousand M is going to literally change the way, I don't know, people live per se. And more importantly, the price per square foot of uh, said property in the, uh, in the area of Chicago. I think it's one of the highest sales um, of price per square foot in the city of Chicago. I don't know if they're still trending that high, but it's good to learn about what's happening because there's a lot of aspiring investors out there. Or even if you just want to learn um, about what's going on and how to do it, um, it's a great platform for you to learn whether you're a professional or just trying to get in the business well and that's that kind of leads into the way that we approach each of the different neighborhoods so this idea of these neighborhood showcase realtors right so you're mentioning a thousand m and you could talk about nema and you could talk about a bunch of other projects so at the south loop level let's just say south loop and everything that's going on at motor row and and all of that you know what we're doing now is we're seeking out showcase realtors that can speak to each individual neighborhood not only as a professional in real estate but as somebody who has deep experience and, and acumen about that individual neighborhood. And so they're all going to be editorial components of the platform as we go forward, 30 wide, 30 different neighborhoods. And it's expert level. This isn't just pay to be on. We're not looking for people that just are paying to get on. You're really looking for people that are entrenched, that are decision makers, oh, yeah, that have experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and they're not, it's not, you know, we're not just taking it from them that, uh, you know, these are seasoned professionals that we trust because we're the ones that are pointing out to our subscribers that this is the guy. If you're moving into or out of that neighborhood, you at least gotta give that guy a call, right? Or a girl. True, and I love it. And I wanna thank you so much for extending that invitation to me. So you'll be seeing my articles on the magazine. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm super excited to co-host with you and write some of these articles for some of the neighborhoods. But let us know when is the event and um, again, yep. give us a little bit more about it. So it's June 27th at the Essex Sky Lounge uh, at the Essex Hotel. Um, it's owned by the Oxford Group. These are the same uh, hotels as uh, London House and uh, the Godfrey and the St. James and uh, the Felix. So it's a beautiful place. Everything they do is just uh, really nice, nicely done. I and love so, it. Yep. You just created a new section for our show, a new segment, Where to Go and What to Do with Ken Monroe. There we go. You like it? Yeah. We love Ken. <laughs> Before Ken goes, like, it's a big shout out to him. I would not be here and I wouldn't have met Carla if it yeah. wasn't for a connection with Ken. And he's really one of the guys that has a heart. There's a lot of guys in the business, uh, but he's genuine. What At you the see, Red and Shy event, as a matter of fact. That was yeah. where we came together, yeah. He literally cares about people. There are uh, no words that I can describe. I don't want to get too mushy, but you really... I'm tear up here. Yeah, the well, feelings are mutual, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> it's really great to have you on, and we're going to be looking forward to a regular segment with you on the show. Thanks, guys. Seriously, in order for everybody to transact and be successful in this business, they need to align themselves with professionals. Obviously, you're highly networked, um, but more importantly, you come from a place that cares. I mean, between you and Jeff Conway, Jeff is amazing as well if you come and emceed and literally if I ever need anything 
I mean, what did I need? An MC if I need a whiskey sponsor for some of our events for St. Jude or anything that we've done together collaborating. Ken is the person to call. He literally, like, in two seconds will respond. I mean, he's busy. He's putting together these amazing events for over, like, what, thousands and thousands of people. Jeff's the one, though. Jeff's, Jeff's the one? <laughs> Jeff's, Jeff's the nicest guy on the planet. I love Jeff. He's Jeff's amazing. that guy that you're embarrassed to be around because he's so nice and you realize that you're nowhere close and you kind of wish that he would <laughs> <So> stop. <sweet. laughs> Chicago scene, I love you guys. You are amazing. Keep up the good work, and God bless you. Love you guys. Thank you. you too. Oh, my gosh. We Look, co-hosted this. We did it. We survived. Oh, my gosh. Not only did we survive, <laughs> we thrived. It's another episode of Market Overdrive where we're really bringing knowledge and helping people that are on uh, the, the show. They're really actually being able to show their showcase and talents, and it's really great to have you back, you know, and, like, good help. You've always been here, but last week I think we were a little bit down, and now you're just bubbly and smiling. I think it's because I'm here. I it's think because it, you're here, it for is. sure, for sure. <laughs> Before we go, I want to make sure that we remind everybody about an event coming up next uh, Friday. It's the Real Estate to the Rescue event. It's $75. It is on uh, the 21st of June, and it starts at 10 a.m., and it's at Deuces and Diamonds. So $75. We're having several silent auction items, and the tickets also include tickets to that day's game at uh, Wrigley Field. So 75 bucks on a Friday is usually what you pay to go see a first place team in the Chicago Cubs. This will be $75, it gets you in, and it also really is a, uh, a charitable thing. So we hope to see a lot of you there. Love it, thank you, Joel. And of course, you know, you can find us on YouTube, also Instagram, so follow us. Thank you for subscribing and sharing this information. And as always, if you have any questions for us or our team, please make sure you reach out to us at info at marketoverdrive.com. Thank you. Thank you for watching another episode of Market Overdrive. If you like the information, please make sure to double S, share and subscribe, and also like, right? Yeah, make sure you follow us on marketoverdrive.com and all of our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We'll see you soon.